Okay, in this video, I'll show you guys how to find the maximum value for sine x times sine y times sine z. Yes, this is calculus 3 because there are three variables. <laughs> anyway, with a condition that actually this is a constraint, okay? x plus y plus z is equal to pi and x, y, z, they are all positive. So the story behind this question is that, well, we need this so we can say that to find the maximum value of a triangle inside of a uh, circle, okay? But uh, yeah, you should have seen my previous video if you haven't. I show you guys how to write an expression for the area of a triangle inscribed in a circle. And we have sine A times sine B times sine C. But in here, we'll just use X, Y, Z. And then we'll use the uh, calculus 3 method uh, to find the maximum for your guess right here, okay? But anyway, what I'm going to do is I'll be using what we call the Lagrange multiplier, okay? So I will just write this down for you guys. Here are the steps. So I will just say by Lagrange, okay? And I will just kind of write down the things that we have to do. First of all, this is the multivariable function, right? And what we will have is we will do f, and we do the partial derivative with respect to x. And we hope to get a constant, and we use lambda for that constant, times and this right here is the constraint equation. And the reason it's x plus y plus z is equal to pi, because x, y, z, they are inside of a triangle. So they should add up to be 180 degrees, then that's pi. And of course, because if they are all angles inside of a triangle, they should all be positive. But anyway, this is the constraint, and usually we'll just denote this by g, okay? g is also a multivariable function, but anyway, f sub x is equal to lambda times g sub x, okay? You do the partial with respect to x in the g function, and then because you have three variables, congratulations, you do three things right here. <laughs> so you also have to look at f y is equal to lambda times g sub y, and then f sub z is equal to lambda times g sub z. And then uh, in the end, of course, you also have to make sure this happens, right? G which is x plus y plus z is equal to pi. You also have to satisfy this equation. But here is the calculus part for now. Okay, so let's get to work. f sub x. Look at this equation, right, this function, and treat x as the variable, and these two are just the uh, constants. So you're just pretty much asking yourself, what's the derivative of sine x, which is just cosine of x, right? So from here, you get cosine of x, and because they are just a constant multiple with that, so they stay the same, so you multiply by sine y and sine z. Okay, so this is partial of x with respect to x. And then you put down lambda times g sub x. This is nice, because this is the g function. The derivative of x with respect to x is just 1. And the derivative of y with respect to x is 0. The derivative of z with respect to x is also 0. So g sub x is just 1. Okay, so that's nice. Okay, so that's the explanation. And now we'll speed up for the rest. f sub y, this is the variable part now. So it becomes cosine y, and then the other two stays. So we have sine x, cosine y, sine z. And this is equal to lambda times and with the same speech, you know this is going to be 1, okay? And then, f z, right? f sub z, uh, you get pretty much sine y, sine, sine x, sine y, and then cosine z. And this is just equal to lambda times 1 as well. All right, now, we do have three equations with three bizarre variables. The good thing is that the right-hand side, it's all equal to lambda. Now, this is what I would like to do. Uh, I will just call, uh, this is equation 1, equation 2, equation 3. And now what we're going to do is, we will take equation 2 minus equation 1. And let me write it down right here. We will have equation 2 minus equation 1, and this is going to give us the following. Notice that both of them have sine z, so we can factor it out first, right? So let me put that down, sine z times and we'll put this down first because we're doing equation 2 minus equation 1. So we have sine x, cosine y, and then minus cosine x, 
sine y like this. And then on the right hand side, we have just lambda minus lambda, which is 0. And now, do we recognize anything? Yes, if you look at this, sine x cosine y minus cosine x sine y, this is exactly the difference formula for sine, right? In other words, this is sine of x minus y. If you expand this, you get that, okay? And then, of course, let's just bring this down as well. We still have the sine z, and this time it's just sine z times sine of x minus y, and we are trying to find x, y, z to make this true. And now, we have two factors multiply, and this is equal to zero. So we have to ask ourselves, when is this factor going to be zero? In another word, sine of what angle will be zero? And let me put this down right here for you guys, just like a little note on the side. We know that sine of zero gives us zero, and we also have sine of pi gives us zero. And of course, we'll just care about from zero to pi because of this condition and this condition. First of all, when we have sine z, we cannot have z equal to zero. We cannot have the first situation because otherwise it contradicts with that. Second of all, can I have z equals to pi? No, because if z is equal to pi, that means x plus y has to be zero, and it's going to contradict with this, you'll see. So let me just tell you guys that we will have a little sad face here. There's no solution based on this part right here, okay? Well, now, let's focus on this, sine of x minus y. This time, we just care about the input inside, which is x minus y. Well, I forgot if I said minus or plus, but this is x minus y. Anyway, in fact, we want to have, let me just put down, we must have x minus y to be 0. Okay, we want the input to be this 0, so that you can actually end up with 0 right here. Why not saying x minus y is equal to pi? Well, if you do that, if you say x minus y is equal to pi, if you're looking at this situation, you, are, you, know, you can add a y on both sides, x is equal to y plus pi. And I'm going to leave this to you guys. If you plug in this back to here, you also end up with some contradiction. Okay? You end up with as I, yeah. And it depends on how much work that you have to show and things like that. But anyway, this is the condition that we need. x minus y is equal to 0. In another word, we are saying, x has to be the same as y. So that's the good part. And now we will continue. So that's from equation 2 minus equation 1. And next I will do equation 3 minus equation 2. And you will see we can come with another similar condition. This time, when we do this minus that, we have the sine x in common. So we can factor that out first. That's sine x times. And we have this minus that sine y cosine z minus cosine y sine z, right? Cosine y sine z. And this is equal to zero as well. And you guys know the deal. This right here will give us, you know, the sine of y minus z. So that's nice. And then sine x times this, this is equal to zero. And with the same reason, I cannot have x equal to 0. I cannot have x equal to pi. So this right here is a little sad face. And we must have this right here, y minus z to be 0. And once again, you don't want to consider pi seriously. And uh, yeah, from here, you add z on both sides. In another word, you're saying y is equal to z. OK? And in fact, we have all the conditions that we need. Why? Because we're saying x is equal to y y is equal to z. And you can, of course, make the connection. x has to be the same as z. Finally, you can say they are all equal, right? So I will just put this down. Thus, we must have x, y, z all being equal to each other. x is equal to y, equal to z. And if you have all three things equal to each other, and they have to add up to pi, well, each one is just going to be pi over 3, isn't it? So. We know this right here, everybody has to be equal to pi over 3 because they are equal. Just do pi divided by 3. So this is pretty much the, 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 the final part. Finally, in fact, this is the only critical number. 
And the idea is that you just kind of plug in back into the original um, function. I will just write this down. We will have the maximum value of the function f, which is going to be sine of x is pi over 3, and then times sine of y, which is also pi over 3, and then you multiply by sine of z, which is also pi over 3. And then you just kind of multiply this out. Sine of pi over 3 is square root of 3 over 2, and likewise, this is the same. And this is, of course, the same. And you can just multiply this out. Square root of 3 times square root of 3 is 3, and then times another square root of 3, you put out 3, square root of 3. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So this right here is the maximum value. Okay? So this is pretty much it. And my final remark is the following. Depending on what your goal is, if you wanted to show that um, the area of a um, triangle is the maximum, it's happening at all the angles are being the same, you could have stopped it right here, right? Because you are trying to show that uh, the maximum area of a triangle inside of a, triang inside of a circle, it has to be equilateral in order to be the maximum area, right? So you could have stopped it right here. But if you just are trying to find the maximum value of this function, you do it all the way, you plug in this value into x, y, z, and then you work this out. Okay, so this right here is it. My first uh, Calculus 3 video, right? It's kind of cool. Anyway, hopefully you guys all like this. And if you guys do, leave a comment down below and let me know. And if you are new to my channel, please subscribe. I like to make math videos for you guys. And as always, that's it.